Welcome back to the Dicebreaker podcast. This is episode 35. Lolies, I'm going to throw instantly over to you because I know you've come prepared. Jump and jive. Jump and jive? (laughs) Come on. Yeah, it's a dance step. Jump and jive. 35. That's where we're at. Bingo calls. What? No. Eat your heart out, friends. I feel like Matt, this is so annoyed. I feel like staying al- like staying alive is like a well known phrase. Jump and jive. Oh. I've never heard anyone say. Well, I don't know. Maybe other than bingo, just that. Maybe bingo was invented before the Bee Gees. So, to be fair, staying alive feels very more apt to this week <laughs> and this year. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh, the wow. feel good feeling we're here for on the dice breaker podcast uh let's get through the introductions before we immediately dive into the uh the sad tunnels <laughs> jump and jive do you mean <laughs> jump and jive gosh oh. uh i'm matt jarvis i am here of course with two of the team this week i'm here with alex Meehan. hello, hello. i am neither jumping nor jiving because <laughs> that would cause problems with the audio i think uh, mm. But let's say I'm jumping and jiving in a metaphorical sense. <laughs> I'm jumping and jiving on the inside. Yeah, yeah, let's say that. <laughs> and of course, Alex Lolis, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? Hello, I'm good, I'm good. Jive, by the way, is my, uh, my favourite dance style. I'm really keen to learn it, the jive. Ooh, I right. actually would like it to be my, my first dance at my wedding. <gasps> to do a jive Wow, my, very energetic. Yeah. Most, most right. people go for the classic waltz. But... Yeah, if, you, if you've if you met my boyfriend, <laughs> you'd be like, mm, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> oh, no, I've met, I've met him. <laughs> very subdued. I, I can see that. <laughs> He's more of a salsa person. <laughs> yeah, rumba, maybe. <laughs> He's more of a um, dad dance. <laughs> Hey now, there's and nothing. I'm talking of dad dancing, <laughs> Matt Jarvis. Oh, hey! Hey! I was once complimented on my dancing. I'll have you know, uh, this was about five minutes before I was punched in the face in the club. So maybe the two were related. Maybe the two weren't. Uh, I was going to ask if it was your mum. <laughs> no. <laughs> wow, roasting. No, who, no, who complimented you and then? You oh, okay, right. Not who punched me thing. in the face. No. Uh, no, it was two separate people though. Uh, oh wow! Well, oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we are here, of course, to talk about this week's bevy of board game news and tabletop RPG news and all sorts of things. What you play on a table. Hmm. Uh, let's <laughs> dive in with what we've been playing this week. Let's start with you, Lolis. What have you been playing? I feel like this has become like my version of me and Scythe update. I've played Love Letter. <laughs> it's all I play. Ah. Um, playing on Board Game Arena, Love Letter Premium. So that's the version that you can play with five to eight players. Um, yeah, just just kicking ass and taking names. Uh, wow, uh, the, the tagline for Love Letter. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't realize that's what you did in Love Letter. <laughs> no, it's not. And I actually haven't been doing that for losing a lot. But I just love it. It's um. I go through phases where I will play it like non-stop, like all of the time. I'll play it at lunchtime. I'll just like any minute I have, I'll play it. Um, and then I won't play it for months, for months. Um, and I feel like it's been probably about a year since I last went through that. Like, oh my God, I need to like, I'm pretty sure like when I was at Big Potato, um, there was like a good, I don't know, three or four months where just every lunchtime just had a few games of it. Um and that's that's what I'm going through at the moment. So. Yeah. That's like uh, me with albums. I'll just listen to the same album for like over and over again for three weeks, and then I won't listen to it again for about five years. Yeah, and then I'll come back. Um, yeah. Have you uh, investigated more love letter history slash narrative slash world building? No, I haven't. I I think I got a bit like sad about. Um, having to pay more for the shipping than for the game although i'm just thinking if they're in america my brother lives in america so maybe i just get them sent to him oh you're talking talking about the other love letter games that we discussed last week yeah 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 um Mm. were were they again uh (laughs) something with d and something with c you know more than me my friend (laughs) i've got it right here i can look it up Mm. it's everyone ready Dominaire and courtier yeah uh, it's, it's yeah the before and after or something that's the one um yeah i really i still really want those but um i haven't done anything to, to try and find 
again. Uh, mm. If you're going for the full set, they do a wedding version, uh, which my <gasps> wife and I tried to get for our wedding. Uh, but it, I think it was when Love Letter was changing publishers. And so they weren't able. And I think they also didn't do it outside of the US. Um, but I think oh. it's literally just Love Letter in a white bag or something like that. Like a... I think she's wearing a wedding dress, the princess. Ah, okay, well. right, there are cousins. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she's already getting married. Well, yeah. yeah, she's she's got a suitor now. She's gonna wow. tie the knot. I it's guess. the sequel. Yeah. I, thought... I wonder. I wonder how it works because the the story behind this one is that you're trying to get your letter to the princess, and then she like the reason that you like. Every, there's several rounds and every round you get a token of affection if you win mm. and then if you've got like a certain number of them you win the game and the story the in the rule book it's described as like um that she's read so many of your letters that she like becomes infatu- infatuated with you and yeah. falls in love with you That's so but like i wonder how i wonder how the um wedding version will work because mm. you're like that bit's already done so what's the story now divorce tokens (laughs) divorce letters (laughs) you're just sending paperwork back and forth (laughs) well you know that's how love in real life works right you just get enough tokens from some other person and then there you go you're gonna get married and maybe in the sequel (laughs) yeah oh right well you know maybe maybe she shamed her mind i don't know (laughs) <laughs> oh, I also came up with a new game. Um, I feel like I came up with it. Um, I did a charity stream on the weekend, and um, one of the things that you could do if you donate a certain amount is that I did uh, what I named Bad Joke Jeopardy, which um, Mian got me this lovely joke book last Christmas because she was my secret ah. Santa. Mm. And um, what I did is it was just me. I would tell you the punchline and the theme. Like it might be ghosts and I would tell you the punchline of the joke and you had to tell me what the joke was. Well. Which is like just the worst way to tell a joke. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was a thing that I did. A game that I played. Mm. I sure. Off with, yeah. I think. Well, no offense to that joke book. And, and I bought you it, but a lot of the jokes in there aren't great. So the fact yeah. that you're not even getting the, you're just getting the punchline first. You're not even getting the setup. Certainly doesn't help matters. Just reading words from a dictionary and trying to work backwards. <laughs> it is, there are terrible jokes, but that's what my weekly jokes are all about. I'm trying to find the worst jokes and and yep. go with it. You know, yep. make make it make it a thing. So that's pretty much it. I haven't really. I don't think I've played anything else. Um, I'm looking forward to. Getting some games at Christmas. Ooh. I never really get board games at Christmas, but my mum asked me what I wanted, and I was like, "Can I just get a board game?" Because I feel like I've just been very. I think m- mostly because we're not in the office and there's not like loads of new games around all the time. I'm like, I haven't really played anything new <laughs> in a while. <laughs> so yeah, that's hmm. exciting. Yeah. yeah. Are you after anything in particular, or are you just? There's a few things that I kind of want. Yeah, uh, I, I think I might ask her for Pandemic Legacy Season 1 because I've been wanting oh. to... I think especially this year, I've been like, I kind of want to get 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 on those. And um, yeah, they're obviously a bit more expensive. So I think that might be a good thing to go for. <laughs> it's like, it's like yep. you know, I, I won't buy it myself kind of thing. Like, <laughs> I mean, I will maybe one day. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but... It's a good no, Christmas like... game, I think, like Legacy. Like over like when you're off for a couple of weeks and you can just play like a chapter each day or each couple of days. Mm. Well, yeah, I won't be going home for Christmas this year. Mm. Um, yeah, so I just two player games it is. Yeah, it's mm. funny actually my um we're we've got well my boyfriend's got friends who live just up the road and they're not going home for, they they're from Ireland as well and they're not going home either this year. So we're going to go to them for Christmas Day. And like Leah, my boyfriend turned around to me the other day and was like, um, do you want to, you're in charge of games. And I was like, no, please. No. <laughs> because I've, I've tried with that lot. Right. So oh, the girl, she's a nightmare. I've, I've tried to teach her a game she already knew, but was playing wrong. And I tried to teach her the right rules. And she just was like a nightmare. And I was like, Leah, I can't, I can't teach these people. <laughs> So that's my Christmas this year is uh, teaching drunk people um, how to play board games. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm going back to my drafts days, but I can't like, but I know them, so it's almost worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like 
there's there's an element of like when you work with board games everyone's like oh you're gonna you're gonna bring the stuff right and you're gonna teach us all and it's like please please i don't want to do more i don't want to do work <laughs> like it's you know I yeah. don't mind if I think I've got a good audience, but I just mm. know already it's gonna just be a pain in the butt. Mm. So I'm just not not looking forward to it. Yeah, my my family, well, my my mum and my brother uh, are interested in playing games with me, so I will teach them, agonisingly teach them how to play. <laughs> uh, my my father just wants none of it. So we're limited to free player games. And those games have to be ones that I can, you know, explain to people who are not that experienced in playing games. Um, so I understand the pain, yes. Uh, I, I expect to experience that this Christmas. <laughs> hmm. yeah. And it's worth saying, if you're looking for good Christmas games, I believe um, one Michael Whelan is putting together a list for the not-too-distant future. Uh, for the YouTube what? channel, and there's already a what list on the website man as well. Doing, but... he's just got a list after list after list. And if you'd like to see any of those, lists, <laughs> just go over to youtube.com forward slash icebreaker, and you'll see all his wonderful list. <laughs> there we go. All right, our job's done here. <laughs> yep, <laughs> we've we've plugged. We can move on. <laughs> all right, uh, Lolis, if that's everything you've been playing or it's... might be playing in the the nearish future. Yeah, Ooh. it's a lot of it's a lot of will be playing, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, let's go over to you, Alex Meehan. What have you been playing recently? Oh, what have I been playing recently? What have we uh, been playing recently, Mister Jarvis? What did we play? <laughs> we played Root, uh, and I won. Yeah, I, you won. <laughs> I actually, I don't know how I won because I oh, felt like I stumbled through it for most of it, and then at some point it was like, oh, I'm like. I'm going to win this turn, which is quite a nice surprise, um, but probably doesn't speak uh, highly of my strategic skills. It's like, oh, right. <laughs> I mean, from my perspective, it seemed like you knew what you were doing. Like, Oh, yeah. Well, that's the that's the perspective I like to give. Um, <laughs> is it? Because <laughs> a lot of the time you're like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll do this. <laughs> Uh, and I'm like, okay, I've been around people who claim that they don't know what they're doing, and then they win enough. So, um, but no, uh, you played the Marquise de Cat. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been uh, a while. Mm, and I played the Airy again. Uh, and we included an AI. We're also playing with another person. Uh, and the AI beat me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I do feel like I benefited from the fact that everyone kind of teamed up on the AI because last time the AI like beat you and your friend so badly <laughs> that I was just in the corner making cats and building workshops and sawmills mm. and you were both just going after the alliance. Well yeah they're the worst and I suppose we still have those memories of um, being defeated dishonorably by the AI. I don't want to do that anymore so I'd rather be defeated by you. Um, yeah I did alright but uh It'd be good to play it again and try a different faction. It is one of those games that's great to, uh, you know, replay the same faction, you know, several times that you get your head around how they work. And I feel like I've got a better grasp of the airy now. Uh, so maybe I should try something new. Maybe mm. give the Woodland Alliance a go. Maybe see see whether I can be just as annoying as the AI is. Or my friend when when they play as the Woodland Alliance, but um, yeah, uh, we played that, and I uh, played uh, last night, which technically would now be earlier in the week. Um, uh, the digital version of Evolution. Oh yeah, I've played the app, the phone app of that before. Mm. Mm. The film with David Duchovny. Yep. Yeah, the one <laughs> I and the knew same. You were gonna I knew you were going to reference that. 2003's Evolution. <laughs> a film that literally no one really is aware of apart from you, and I have vague memories of it. They Very did a great, vague. they made a great animated series of Evolution. Uh, I'm but, aware of that, yes. Yeah, yeah see? Well, no need to speak ill of Evolution. <laughs> Killing yeah, is popular enough to warrant a cartoon. This is, this. you're talking to someone who is known amongst the group as having the cultural touchstones of the 1970s. Uh, it's a running joke that I'm not I'm not down with whatever the kids are doing these days. 
so the fact that I'm aware of evolution doesn't still doesn't speak, you know, hugely well uh, of that. But anyway, enough of that rubbish. Um, this is evolution, the board game, or in this case, the the digital version. Fantastic um, game, by the way. Fantastic game. Fantastic game. Fantastic game. Oh, wow. <laughs> AS- ASMR there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I played on Switch, uh, I'll disclaimer, I was given a code by the publisher, uh, and yeah, I played on my Nintendo Switch, uh, the version on there. Oh, mm. that's cool. Yeah, it, it looks nice, like, um, you know, sometimes it could be a bit slow loading up, but I don't know, maybe that's the Switch or maybe that's the game, doesn't really matter. Uh, there's, a, there's a weird guy in it who has a moustache and he teaches you how to play the game. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think he might be in the phone app as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I remember him, yeah. Uh, I think his name's Darwin. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That rings a bell. And he's like, oh, I'm going to teach you how to play Evolution. I'm like, okay, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> We've just met. That <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is it literally Charles Darwin? Is no, uh, okay. I, think he's I was gonna say you're just like, yeah. There's this weird guy with a mustache, and he's really big into evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it, it, I believe it's not the Charles Darwin because uh, he's been dead for quite a while. Why not? Yeah, I assume the voice actor isn't Charles Darwin. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no voice lines. It's just occasionally, you know, he'll make a a, a noise to maybe match. <laughs> To maybe match what he's feeling at the time. Like, mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the the game itself is interesting. I still don't really entirely understand how it works. But I think that's mostly just my brain trying to get around it. But um, you start the game with uh, like a species of animal of some sort. Uh, and you have to try and keep your animals alive by feeding them every turn. Uh, And you can kind of build your population, your animal's population, by playing cards. You can make them bigger by also playing cards on them. You can start new species as well. uh, And you can give your different species traits to help them in the game. So um, traits like, you know, you feed the species next to you as well as yourself. And you, you know, you have better defense and things like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so in this game, I was playing against the AI um, uh, who, you know, put up a bigger fight than (laughs) I would have liked, to be honest. The AI I found in the app, the mobile app version is quite tough. Like, I've never come anywhere near winning with the AI. It's Uh, stupid. I'm I'm just trying to, I'm like, look, mate, I'm just trying to learn the game. Like, (laughs) yeah, and he's like, Bam! Bam! Stay down! <laughs> like, just let me win once, you know, and then... That's not ever... Trying, a... trying to teach you the lesson. Yeah, dog eat dog world, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Survival well... of the fittest. You're not going to evolve like that, are you? Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the loading screens, there are passages from um, the... Oh, my goodness. You know, the book that Charles Darwin wrote. <laughs> Uh, and this is coming from someone who's read it. The theory of evolution. The theory of evolution. Origin of species. Oh, the origin oh, of species. One, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, this is coming from someone who's who's read it um, for university or whatever. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, at, at some point, you can turn your species into carnivores, and they have to feed on other species uh, rather than from the plants. That are available from the watering hole. <laughs> the yeah. watering hole, yes, uh, and yeah, that kind of changes the dynamic of the game because it's a bit of a risk because uh, uh, you've got to hope that you can eat the other species available because if they're a certain size, your carnivore cannot prey on them, um, and there are cards that protect against carnivores as well. But um, managed to get through the initial tutorials, and then it was like, here, play against three other AI. That didn't go well. <laughs> and then if you lose, you just have to redo it again. Oh, really? Yeah, no, wow. it doesn't let you. <laughs> you have to win this or you can't play the rest of the game. Well, again, 
Just teaching you life. Life lessons mm. right there. Yeah. Get good, apparently. <laughs> get good, get fast. Yeah, I think that's what Charles Darwin wrote, right? Get yeah. good, scrub. Get good, yeah, scrub, uh, exactly. That was his second book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Once uh, once he'd gone through all that controversy, he, he was like, okay, I'm just going to go for it now. <laughs> I um, think if he was alive and he was on Twitter, that would be like his hashtag. Get, get good, get scrub. Good. Yeah, to be honest, I wouldn't want to imagine what he'd be like on Twitter if he was alive, because he mm. also wrote some not very nice things in that book uh, that we're all aware of. Um, anyway, yeah, that's not in this game. It's it's all right. It's, yeah. it's good, yeah. It's a good right. game. Yeah, maybe I'll play it some more and, and get good. So. Yeah. I think I find, I find it's nicer to play in real life. I don't know why... I something about it i just think is is more pleasant irl yeah the IRL. art's nice i like the art yeah um, and also the, the starting player in the game gets a dinosaur like a little like Bronchosaurus. Uh. yeah and it's like quite big and it's it's great and it's completely unnecessary and i love it mm. <laughs> and that's what i've been playing mr jarvis all that's right it's all about it it what's it yeah just you know the thing well, yeah, obviously I played a bit of Root uh, with you and won. I'd like to repeat. Reiterate that, yeah. yeah. yeah and make sure that we get <laughs> yeah. that down on the record. Yeah, yeah on the record. Um, Matt got good. Yeah, I played a little bit of The Shores of Tripoli, uh, which is a new historical game uh, coming out from, I think, Fort Circle Games is the publisher. Um, but it's based on a period of history at the end of the 18th century. I'm not great on American history, so apologies uh, for people who are, and I will almost immediately get facts wrong. Um, but it's based kind of after the American uh, Revolution. Um, and it's it's really simple and straightforward in terms of gameplay, but it's got a lot to think about. Um, so one player plays the US uh, and one player plays Tripoli. Um, and the idea is that the US is blockading Tripoli, as it did at the end of the 18th century. Mm. Um, and Tripoli, basically Tripoli is trying to amass a certain amount of wealth or destroy enough American frigates. And the Americans are trying to eventually like launch an assault on Tripoli itself and take over the city. Um, but the, the actual card play is just each turn. There are, I think there are six main harbors on the map. Maybe more than that, maybe nine. Um, but you move your boats between the harbors and the naval patrol zones around the outside. And you pay cards or play cards to move your ships or you can play cards as events um so you might be able to build more ships or you might be able to get some reinforcements from Malta or Sweden or something like that um but it's it's very it boils down to essentially um dice battles which I was quite surprised by so you get a load of frigates and then you move them to a harbor and if there is if there are enemy ships as the Americans um if there are Tripoli ships there you roll a load of dice depending on how many frigates you have and then they roll a load of dice and you do damage and that's kind of that's the the meat of the combat system which i, I think i was surprised by that i haven't played loads so i need to dig into a bit more but it was it came across as very kind of luck dependent because you have to roll sixes to hit um so you can end up just getting absolutely wiped out uh, if someone happens to roll very luckily um, and Tripoli can launch pirate raids using its Corsairs on different harbours. And when, when it does that, it only needs to roll a five or a six to get gold. And if it gets 12 gold pieces, it wins. Um, so I think I, w I was a big fan of kind of like the card action where it's like, okay, I'm playing these cards, I'm moving my boats around and so on. And then when it came down to the dice, I am. if anyone's ever watched Dungeon Breaker, they'll know that I have terrible, terrible luck all the time. <laughs> So I was just rolling nothing and Tripoli would then roll like four sixes and just wipe out a load of my boats or get a load of gold. Um, so that that element I was kind of a little bit unsure about. I think I need to play more of it. it I, you know, it's not, I'm not saying it's unbalanced or anything like that, but I think the, the element I really liked was kind of the tight, I'm playing these cards, I'm moving my boats around um, rather than the we're going to get together and throw 12 dice at each other. There's a card in there that when you launch the assault on Tripoli, the guns of Tripoli, which is a card that the Tripoli player can play, uh, it adds 12 dice to their dice pool. So Whoa. they can have a lot of dice. How do you even hold 
12 dice. It's yeah, there. it's it's really kind of extreme. Um so yeah, I was kind of like I I enjoyed it for what it was. I need to play more of it. I've only played it the once so far. Um mm. and it was it was straightforward enough, but it also felt like maybe I'm missing something in it so far. Um because I expected it to be a much kind of tighter game and it had a lot of dice rolling but maybe that's just the way we played as kind of total beginners i'm mm. just looking at the box oh my god it's like the most board gamey looking board game <laughs> ever it's it's got really nice i think i assume they're paintings from the era um but the paintings are nice as <laughs> like <laughs> it, it, it's a really nice. nice looking board game it's got really nice components it's got little wooden ships um the board is despite the fact there are only nine kind of circles there's a lot of board there's just kind of a lot of space yeah. that does nothing. Um, yeah. So it was a much bigger board and box than I expected. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying it. As someone that likes history games but is not particularly up on history or good at them, um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I also have played... This isn't... Uh, well, it isn't currently a physical tabletop game, uh, but I'm going to use it to transition into news. I played a little bit of Orlog, which is the Viking dice game in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, which isn't a real Viking dice game, it turns what? out. Jarvis! Hello. Video games! I know, yeah. Yeah, what is this? Yeah, no, well... <laughs> I'm just joking. I, I played it, you know, for research purposes. Um, yeah, it's... He says. <laughs> I saw a load of people getting very excited about it, um, but it's, it's like a really simple dice game inside the world of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which takes place in the Viking era. You, you just throw dice, you get free rolls, and you can choose each time to keep dice. And the dice do damage, so they overdo axe damage, arrow damage, so ranged so melee. Tokyo. Yeah, basically. And then your opponent can block with helmets or shields, and you can also get god powers by building up like your favours with the gods and then using them to do more damage and stuff like that. It's fine. Like, I saw a lot of people getting really excited and being like, I spent my whole weekend playing Orlog. It's like... It's it's fun enough for what it is, but it's because they had a taste. They had a taste of a tabletop game. They were like, it, <laughs> it, it was just kind of like this is like it's so simple that it's like yeah, this is a fun two minute diversion. But I yeah. don't know. I but uh, those games kind of click. Maybe it's because you know mm. better though, man. You know, I would oh. never be so bold to suggest that. <laughs> um, I don't know. Some of those games click more than. You know, mm. others like I remember playing Gwent in The Witcher Three and just not really. Yeah, I never it. got Gwent. Either. Like, uh, but people would say to me, "All I do in the game is play Gwent," and I'm like, "I'm very happy for you." Yeah, and then, that, feel... <laughs> and then that game became its own thing. So. Yeah, I feel like Gwent. At least you can build your deck. There's a bit of thing. like Orlog. You just turn up and it's always the same dice. You can change your, I think, your God favor thing, but it's not. There's not loads of customizability. Um, but transitioning into the news section of this show, it turns Whoa! out that there is a physical version of Orlog coming, which is why I've mentioned it. Um, so this was a nice little scoop that Chase, who is our lovely news writer, managed to bag from Ubisoft. Um, scoop! The developer, indeed, scoop. Um, so yeah, it, Orlog will be coming out next year. That's kind of all we know, is they just confirm, like, yep, we're making a we're making a physical version um, with a collectibles manufacturer, I think, called Pure Arts. So... I mean, I presume it would just be the two sets of dice and maybe some bowls, because that's kind of what that game is. Like, a couple of tokens for the gods. But, you know, I, it was kind of like, yeah, this is this is fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then I yeah. moved on and, and played some more Shores of Tripoli. Yeah, I mean, um, as long as they... I mean, by the sounds of it, the game already kind of works to an extent. Of, like, people enjoy it. Um... As long as like the quality of the pieces are nice and they don't pull the the butt out of the uh, the price, uh, yeah, I don't mind. You know, I probably won't pick it up myself because it doesn't really sound like the kind of game I like. Dice games quite a bit. Like you know, I play Yahtzee uh, mostly because my mum likes it. I, I think it's all right. Or, or like um, Ganshon Clever, yeah. yeah. Like that's a great dice game. Like, um, whereas this one sounds very simple, which is fine. But I don't know when you've when you've had a experience of like you know dice games that have a bit more depth to them. 
or, or like zombie dice is fine like those games are fine so i'm sure this will do well because it has the assassin's creed kind of name attached to it and people have already you know been enjoying it in the game so it makes sense to me that they're doing a physical copy because it's just like more stuff we can sell yeah and maybe now that they've seen the popularity of it they'll build it out a bit and maybe come up with variants that do have that extra level of maybe you can, you can change the dice you have in your pool or you can do something else or i don't know I, that would be wonderful if they did but i suspect they will just yeah like, i suspect the... throw out oh this will do people like it already like you know having experienced you know video game games are a mixture we've, we've had some that are like really good like people really like the resident evil um board game from what i've heard it's pretty good um like the darkest dungeon one that's coming out next year seems to you know capture the feeling of the game but when there are ones like this where it's kind of based on like a smaller aspect of the game i'm always kind of like mm. i don't know i get king's Ga gambit kind of vibes oh those yeah aren't good those aren't good vibes at all <laughs> those are bad vibes yeah uh well actually someone sent an, e an email in about this so we'll get we'll get oh. to that at the end of the show but it's it'll be a Teaser. running theme there we go yeah uh but yes uh that is the first news story is that it's coming out next year um i'm sure it'll be fine yeah. yeah, I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, second up on the news on the news board this week is the crew, uh, which if anybody's listened to this podcast, probably any episode we've mentioned the crew at least once, um, because everybody loves it on the Dice Breaker team. Everybody, everybody loves the crew. The crew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wow, this song is catchy, huh? Yeah? The. the <laughs> The crew is getting a sequel, um, and it is going from space to the deep sea. Uh, it is called The Crew Mission Deep Sea, in fact. Wow. Um, it looks good. Yeah, it's we don't we don't know loads about it so far. Um, it was teased by Cosmos, uh, which is the publisher of The Crew, um, and they they did confirm that it's it sounds much like The Crew. So it plays, I think, with three to six people, three to five people. Mm -hmm. Um, and it appears to be similarly mission based. Um, so like the crew had, I think 50 missions in the original box for the crew. Yeah, They've put some out so, since, yeah. right? But, um, it sounds like that'll be similar. They have said that it will have new gameplay, uh, kind of mechanics and rules, uh, but they haven't confirmed what those are, but, uh, the original designer, um, Thomas Singh is, is working on it. So it's yeah. from, from the same designer. It sounds like it's not just a retheming. It will offer some new things. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it'd be interesting to see what they do with a new crew because yeah, the crew I think just kind of came out of nowhere for all of us and was like, oh, this game, this game's really, really good. Mm. If it ain't broke, it, we we were laughing because uh, it's um, does it, did somebody say it, it's got whales in an hour? Was that a joke? Because I, we were like laughing about the fact that this is like Johnny's like almost favorite game of the year, and now it's got whales in it. <laughs> I don't think I don't think whales are confirmed yet, but you know no. it's it's in the ballpark of whales. I mm. thought I saw something about whales. <laughs> I think Matt posted a joke in the Slack about. No, no, I think I saw some. I thought I saw something on like Instagram. Oh, about okay, um, maybe. Hey, maybe, maybe there there are whales in it, but uh, yeah, I suppose if the crew the crew works really great, so. You know, building on that is probably the best way to go, rather than just totally, you know, redesigning things for the sake of it. Yeah, uh, and it looks again. We there's no uh, information yet, but it seems like it will be similarly sized. So I'm guessing it will probably come out around the same kind of price point, which I yeah. think was fifteen quid. It, yeah. The crew wasn't expensive That's at all. It was like a small box. Yeah. Yeah, love that. Um, love that sort of thing. Yeah. So that will be released next year, Cosmos has said. Board Game Geek uh, kind of looked around some retailers and said that it's up for a release date of March the 1st, but I don't think Cosmos have confirmed that yet. But either way, it will hopefully be coming soon. Wonderful stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, moving on to the next story here. Uh, wow. Well, well. that's, that's the Uno noise. <laughs> this story is about Uno, uh, everybody's favorite card game, by which I mean everybody's heard of it and goes, eh, I don't really feel like playing that right now. <laughs> um, Uno's being turned into a TV show. 
uh, which is what? an interesting prospect. Um, so this is from Variety, uh, which said that the name of it is called The Uno Game Show. Oh, yeah. So, you know, really just does what it says on the tin there. Um, it will see four teams competing in physical challenges and trivia as well, as well as, quote, other creative elements as they try to become like the Uno champion. Um, they don't mention at all how this actually relates to what you do in Uno. Yeah. The Like the colours and the numbers and, and cards and so on. So whether it's it's just pure, we have this thing that people know the name of, we'll stick it on yeah, this I mean, TV show. Come on, let's, nah, let's not beat about the bush. We know that's what it is. I mean, that's what it is. Like, <laughs> it's obviously they were like, you know what people like, Uno. Let's like is a strong them. term. I mean, people know of it. Yeah, people I know guess. of Uno. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not judging everyone's opinion on Uno, but like, I don't know why, other than the name recognition, I don't know why Uno would be the first property you jump to for making a game show, you know? I guess it's, you know, like you say, it's just popular. So this is from um, Propagate is the studio working on, on this, which is notable because Propagate is the studio that last year was announced to be working on the Ticket to Ride TV show, um, which is also a kind of competition where people try to travel as far as they can, uh, which hasn't broadcast yet, and I don't think it has a broadcast date. Um, mm, and it's worth saying this, this Uno game show, uh, according to Variety, uh, which first reported this, um, it said that it's yes, yet to be picked up um, by a network, um, but attached to it is uh, an executive producer who worked on The Price is Right. It's got, I think, um, Propagate itself worked on things like Chopped and Charmed and Running Wild with Bear Grylls. So it's, it's you know, <laughs> it's like, it's quite big in terms of the names that are floating around this strange yeah. Uno TV show, but... You know what? Like, the thing is, game shows that are a bit looser, like Taskmaster, for example, which I'm a big fan of, and is pretty popular in the... Uh, I don't know exactly how popular it is, but, like, I see a lot of people talking about it, which also has its own board game now, by the way. I saw that in the shops, and I was like, mm, not sure about that. Um... You know, those kind of game shows do work, but they mostly work because the writers behind them are, like, funny. You know, like, they think up the tasks that are ridiculous and don't really have much in the way of, like, oh, this is a game show. Um, it's it's more sort of a laugh. So maybe they're sort of riding off that loose interpretation of the game show. Um you know, that's sort of been floating around. But I don't know why Uno has to have anything to do with it. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess we'll find out at some point in the future if it gets picked up. Will we find out, Matt? I don't, Are we going to? Well, I mean, if I'm it, not going to watch it. Airs, <laughs> I, I might watch it and go, you huh. Me and you have to because you have to write about it. Yeah. No! <laughs> every single week you have to write a column yeah. about it. You have to review every episode of Uno Game Show, the Uno Game Show, whatever it's called. Look, I sometimes feel like I'm in my own version of Taskmaster, where I'm made <laughs> to do things that humiliate me, like writing about Monopoly constantly, and that's sucking my soul out, and now I have to write about Uno. Oh my lord. <laughs> this is no, all... I think, I'm, I think this needs to come up in the next room. No, no, no. This is all a joke. Don't worry. <laughs> well. I, I'm not... I'm not... Yeah, I'm exaggerating my suffering. It's more just like, oh, okay, another Monopoly, eh? At least they haven't made a Monopoly TV show yet. Oh, God, Lord, Then you please. know we're in for it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pitch that. I mean, no, that you can no. see. You move around a board, I guess. It's just people Fighting. charging rent. Yeah, I mean, that's just what happens in real life. But, <laughs> that's just real life, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just the real life. Like, Monopoly is what the game of life is trying to be. Yeah, yeah. Y yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Not really, because nobody owns property. <laughs> nobody <laughs> our 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we only ever pay rent. I think in my head, and this will, this is another niche TV reference for you, but in my head, the Una game show is just going to be like 50-50 with Angelica Bell. <gasps> oh, um, my goodness. But with the four, I think there are four Una colours, right? Like red, blue, yellow. Yeah, 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 yeah. <gasps> yeah. Oh, yeah, and the different teams. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm on board for that. I'd yeah, like sure. 50-50. Yeah, that could be great. You know. Yeah. Uh, right. We're turned around on the Una show. Yeah. Like, Someone put... <laughs> played a reverse direction card on our opinion. Whoa. If they put Gunge in it, then I'm totally Gunge. on I don't... board. Is, is there an Uno reason for Gunge? There's no Gunge card in Uno. Well, there, there will be now. Mm. Yeah. There is that well. one where it fires the cards out of like a big cannon at you. <laughs> that, that, that's what they're going to do. Out of a big <laughs> cannon. I think yeah. it's a card shooter. No, it's a cannon, yeah. Lolis. Come it on. felt like a cannon at the time, Lolis. <laughs> I was about six. <laughs> yeah, zzz, 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 and then it would get jammed with cards. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. All right. I actually, do you know what I'm keen to get? Oh. I really want to get that version of Monopoly that accepts oh, the... credit card. Oh, I thought you were going to say the Monopoly gun thing that fires money. No. What? I had, I oh, had no, that would be too much. No, I, ha- I actually had that. Because um, I, I know the, the guys who came up with the idea because it was, it was with another company before they sold it to Hasbro. Um, and so we I was selling that product for a while. <laughs> can, we just, can we just roll the tapes back here? Uh, a money gun. Yeah. Yes. Is and you there... had to catch it. And then you had to try and get catch the most of it. It was like the crystal maze like bit where you catch the money. See, this got. is terrible because you're equating things that I really like, like the crystal maze, with things that I really don't like, like like money gun and monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I don't know if they changed it from monopoly, but in the original version there was like some things that um, there was like one note which was like you have to tidy up at the end because obviously like tidying up after that is like the worst part um, and things like that. Or Come double on. your money, or half your money. Or yeah, I think some of them are really good. There were chance and community chess cards, so I would guess they did the same thing. I have actually played it, but I clearly just wiped it from my mind. It was like mm. I was part of like a judging panel for some awards thing, and it was one of the nominated games. Oh, it's like, God. nah. Uh, yeah, maybe yeah, not. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to this next story. Alex Meehan, uh, tell us about Wild Sea. I will be more than happy to. Uh, Wild Sea is a role-playing game uh, that's inspired by Bastion, uh, which is a video game by Supergiant Games. That's the company behind uh, Hades, if people are playing that at the moment. But I think Bastion was one of their first games. If I not think it was their first game, game, yeah. Yeah, it was quite popular at the time as well. But um, yeah, it cites uh, Bastion as one of its influences, along with Blaze and Dark. Uh, the uh, role-playing game uh, which we've played Uh indeed Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're big fans of Um, uh, in this you're playing as sailors who are sort of commanding a ship but that ship happens to uh, move around by (laughs) using chainsaws to cut through the top of a forest like canopy basically (laughs) What what else? It's How a else wild, did you get around? yeah. It's a pretty <laughs> wild idea. <laughs> hey, so essentially, like uh, trees have finally finally taken matters into their own hands, uh, and sort of grown to the point where most of the the world, at least this part of the world, is uh, covered in trees and, and foliage and all those sort of things. So you take the place of crew members on this ship, uh, sort of just sailing around and you know uh uh following quests and and gathering rewards and what else you you want to do um you can play as very different uh people from different cultures so um you can play as your standard sort of human if you want or or you can play as a spider a a, a group of spider people <laughs> called the Selly Cray, I think. Uh, You can play as a cactus person called the Ectus and some sort of fungi sort of individuals. Um, They are called the the Gal, I believe. Uh, And you can sort of be a medic or a hunter uh, and you can design your own ship. 
Uh, it's actually sound really cool, and the artwork is amazing. Yeah, the artwork's great. Mm. Um, it's really good. I'd really recommend looking at that. Um, it uses like a D6 sort of system um, where, you know, you describe what you want to do and then roll your dice, and depending on your, your result, an outcome sort of occurs. Uh, and it, it's been made by someone called Felix Isaacs. Uh, and this being their first sort of big role playing project, um, yeah, it looks really interesting. It's on Kickstarter until well, uh, by now, by the time you listen to it, it will no longer be on Kickstarter. There might be late pledges, um, but yeah, and it looks like it's going to be released sometime uh, next August. Whoa, yeah, there are there are a set of free. Kick, uh, quick start rules that you can download from the website the um, Wild Sea website so if you want to have a look at those you can yeah I'm interested it looks really nice and, yeah so it's a, one of those games where the, the kind of concept of it just stood out very quickly it's like oh yeah, right yeah, yeah. like that's chainsaw ships okay like on, <laughs> on the, kind of on the face of it it's like oh okay but then actually yeah. look at it it's like oh that's actually a really a really interesting way of doing a kind of sailing RPG, but not just having it be your pirates yeah. or your you know, explorers. Pirates. Or, yeah. yeah. Mm. So yeah, um, and like you say, it looks it looks really really nice. Mm, yeah, and then there seem to be some really interesting people behind it who have, you know, used Kickstarter for the purpose it's supposed to be used for, which is when you've got a new project and you're kind of relatively unknown and you need some money to get it going then kickstarter is great great for that um so yeah i'm definitely interested and maybe i'll take a look at it in the future Mm -hmm. who Uh, knows who knows uh finally on the news list is another one from you man uh coffee traders yeah Uh, i love coffee (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> a little bit right. too much i think <laughs> i live for it um yeah coffee traders is um a new game from capstone games uh which is a relatively biggish publisher they've done games like pipeline and uh terra mystica which is fairly well liked in uh last year's maracaibo uh, this game is about playing, uh, you're playing coffee farmers. Uh, so you're growing uh, coffee bean plants uh, across you know, countries in S- Central and South America and Africa and Asia. And um, it's sort of set during a period where free trade sort of started becoming more of a, a thing that was happening. So, you know, farmers could start, you know... Um, negotiating for better compensation for their, their products and such. Uh, so you take the role of one of these farmers uh, as they sort of start growing uh, more stretches of, of land for their, or cultivating more stretches of land for their coffee bean plants, um, you know, selling to more uh, businesses, improving the living conditions of their workers and sort of developing their communities. Um, and yeah, you, you, it's a standard, you get your points, you build your business, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen a lot of those before, but it's nice to have, uh, something covered that isn't so commonly covered. Um, yeah. Like the history of coffee farming. Yeah. I feel like there, there were a couple of games recently that were about tea. Mm. Um, gosh, I can't remember. One of them was set. In I think a region of India, I want to say where a certain type of tea is grown, um, but I think there's only other one coffee. There's only one other coffee game I can think of, which was like a small I think roll and write thing that was mm. just about serving up coffee. So yeah, it's kind of amazing that nobody's, or well, at least to my gosh, like this isn't something that people have explored because it feels like there are so many other games about trading some yeah, kind of some kind generic of bean or yeah grain or what have you so mm, yeah yeah no um the cover art is lovely um and yeah i, I don't there aren't any more details of it yet 
uh, including the release date, which is kind of set for next year, but there's no set, again, date. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it looks interesting. And again, it's nice to have, um, you know, games focusing on different parts of the world and different kinds of people. And, and you know, something like Coffee Trade, which I imagine for the area which it happens in is like a fundamental part of that community so yeah isn't there wasn't there this week um isn't there an award about um games that depict historical periods uh so your is the zenobia award mm. i think uh so it is a new award that's aiming to kind of um like support uh, underrepresented designers uh, in particular um, so it's backed by one of the big names attached to it is Cole Worley, um, who folks might know from Root uh, and Pax Premier and John Company and stuff like that. Um, so it's it's a kind of mentorship program, I think, also with a cash reward um, or cash award, sorry, um, to help uh, like folks who you know aren't the the typical face of games, unfortunately, um, mm. to help them get into the industry and be heard and have their voice um kind of put out there mm. um so yeah it's it's yeah so like i say cole Worley's attached um dr christian l hines um from southern illinois university edwardsville which is a very long title for a place um so they said that the zenobia award was everyone who's not a quote white male straight usually yeah. academic <laughs> often a part-time dabbler in spurious facial hair yeah um <laughs> so We've yeah seen a lot of those <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so it's what's interesting about it as well is so it's it's deliberately designed to support historical games but mm. they've said that um the game should play at under two hours which i think really shows that they're going for games that have a good potential to you know to be a big mainstream hit because yeah. historical games war games aren't necessarily something Most that loads of people yeah you know they can play on for hours and they can often be quite impenetrable for a lot of people mm. Um, so this, it feels like they're trying to get people in on both sides of the table. So they're trying to get more and more designers in, and they're also trying to, I think, bring out games that players who might not have looked at historical games before might be interested in. So it seems a, yeah, it seems a really good initiative. Um, mm. and it's so often the case that even games that do focus on cultures, on people who aren't just americans or, or english or european or whatever uh even they are made by people who are not from that culture mm -hmm. or from that racial background and it's kind of like come on like like yeah even when they have consultants to help them it's kind of like are you really the person the best person to to do this like or like can we see some people you know other people making these kind of games so yeah, well, hopefully this will be that will spur it in that direction. So they've said the only, uh, other than it having to play it below two hours and not have like a, a referee or role play, so it's not an RPG. Mm -hmm. um, it should tackle some historical subject, uh, political, social, cultural, scientific, economic, military, or other. So it's not just here's another World War Two game or here's oh. you know, here's another conflict game. It sounds like they are they're really coming at the idea of a historical game from all angles. So yeah, it's hopefully. You know, um, <clears throat> so they've said they'll uh, pick someone by October 15th, 2021, I believe. Uh, oh, so involvement in the mentorship design and awards processes uh, oh. is projected to wrap up on October 15th, 2021. So hopefully we see some kind of some interesting games emerge from this and hopefully some new designers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested to see uh, what comes of this. Yeah, there we go. All right. Sounds good. Let's move on to emails. If you've got an email for the Dicebreaker podcast, you can reach us at podcast at dicebreaker.com. You can find us on Twitter at join dicebreaker. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us at dicebreaker.com or youtube.com slash dicebreaker. Lolies is getting serious. <laughs> the glasses are on. Oh. <laughs> uh, as you put on your glasses, Lolies, uh, would you mind reading this one from Emily, please? I would not mind at all, Matt. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, Emily says, Hi, folks. I was wondering what is the most blatant cash grab licensed product you've ever seen in board games? 
obviously Ty and Monopoly games are up there, but is there any less known ones that annoyed you? Conversely, are there any licensed tie-in games that you thought were actually really well thought out and effective? Thanks as always for everything you do. Emily. Yes, Emily. Yes to all of the above. <laughs> um, obviously, Funko Pop is one. That, oh. <laughs> that, um, you were you know, nicer I, on it as well. You were nicer about it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, right. Wheels and I did a video on it. And he's all like, oh, you love this game so much. No, I didn't love the game so much. What I was saying is that I think there's an audience for it. And I stand by that because I still believe there's an audience. There clearly is. No, but no, I thought no. it's yeah. like, it's a game that works for people who are not massively into board games. Maybe kids. Maybe kids. Um, and uh, yeah, and I was trying to be more open-minded than one michael whelan i mean that's not very hard is it like... <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah but everyone's like oh you're so in love with this game no i was just trying to be no be the other side of the coin here you know which i thought was needed yeah i mean that the my biggest gripe with that game other than it being bad was the fact that even the the funko pop things were like they look like they look rubbish as well so like yeah. one of the main reasons you'd buy the game would be to have the little I don't know what you call them miniatures I guess uh, and they, they look rubbish so they look worse than the normal Funko Pop so like they haven't even <laughs> they haven't even bothered with that <laughs> yeah but I mean for 30 quid you're getting one of those uh, a couple of those and you're getting a board game so I mean like if you're thinking about production costs of how much that probably cost them to make like I yeah I guess so um what other games comparing at 30 pounds or whatever yeah i think that, that is what you're gonna get <laughs> it's probably pretty good for for 30 pounds mm. um there is also some games that have done a good job license time i think um let me think because <laughs> jaws jaws is a good one yeah oh, yeah yeah um it's one i've on my shelf back there i think there's i think in most recent years like most like very very recent years um they've started to come out with more good ones isn't um i've not played that marvel game but the you guys are the lads or somebody likes the marvel game right which marvel game one? are you talking yeah, about marvel uh, champions yeah, yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah marvel champions good. is really good yeah i would recommend <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Villainous, I guess. Is that Disney? Yeah. yeah Villainous is pretty good. I was going to yeah. say. I've not Villainous. played it, but it's meant to be good. It's yeah. designed by the same studio as Jaws as well. So mm. I think Prospero Hall, which, funnily enough, became Funko Games. I think they were absorbed into Funko Games. I might yeah. be. So they, they went from having a really good track record because um, they did uh, Hogwarts Battle and the Toy Story version of Hogwarts Battle that I can't remember. Yeah. Which are like solid deck builders. Like Jaws is really good. Villainous is strong. Mm. Um, and now they are part of Funko Games. Been tainted forever now. <laughs> <laughs> they they sold their souls away. <laughs> no, I'm uh, sure it wasn't their fault. <laughs> I will. I think on the the worst licensed game I've played, there is a there there are many. Um, <laughs> Matt's like I've seen things. I've what, seen what spaceships that? off the. What was that WWE? Oh, WWE Royal Rumble <laughs> card game. Yeah, that's not great. Was that no. No, was that a card game? The the, the oh the ring. What was that? Hero oh, that's Clicks. WWE Hero Clicks. Yeah, I mean that was it's fine. Yeah, uh, it's Hero Clicks. Um, w, WWE Royal Rumble card game though, not good. Um, but there is a game that is called I think it's called Star Wars Han Solo card game. <laughs> um which i reviewed uh way back when um and it is sabak i think it's like the in universe um card game that they play in star wars and it's just rubbish um it's i think it's quite expensive for what it is the cards are really thin so it doesn't make a good impression off the bat and then the game is just crap basically it's like a really bad version of i think it's like a playing card game. I can't remember whether it's Blackjack or something else. I think it's based on Blackjack. But it's just really naff. Um, mm. And yeah, that was that was a bad time. Um, I think in terms of good things, like Villainous is, is right up there. Villainous is a great game. Um, like, I think I will, I'll go out to bat for... I think the Bloodborne card game is decent. I think 
the um, the Resident Evil Two board game is actually surprisingly good, mm. um, which I was surprised by because Steam Forge also made the Dark Souls board game, which I thoroughly disliked. So you know, yeah, it's definitely some. yeah. Some some games are better than others. Some just go here's a load of miniatures of the things you like. I think that tends to be where it slips into not as yeah. good territory. Like you're not really trying very hard, are you? <laughs> With this one, when they do that, you're like, I oh, yeah, yeah, you're going off the name alone. Um, yeah, so bad licensed games I've played. The thing is, right? Uh, when I started playing board games, you know, beyond your, your classic Monopoly, whatever. Um, like I was. Uh, in a friend group who were gracious enough to make sure that we mostly played good games. So I didn't have as much opportunity to play bad licensed games. Um, I guess like one of my earliest memories of playing board games, we had a <laughs> we had a weakest link board game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which came in like it looked like a CD player like the game board if you could call it that and it had like audio and like effects and stuff so it would play like the theme tune from the show it for our us listeners is the weakest link a thing in the us i don't know I f- but... yeah i think i think it crossed the, the border crossed the water. yeah but, um yeah it's just a get it's just a game show where um and What's her name? Anne Robinson. Robinson. Yeah. yeah, she would just berate people and be really mean. It and is. They... They've got the USA one, and she's also in that one. Well, there you go. Yeah, mm. and then and then she just called people stupid. Yeah, my <laughs> my dad <laughs> was meant the... to be on Weakest Link, uh, <laughs> and then he broke his leg, and they didn't have accessible. Um, oh, that's nice. Like, isn't it? So he couldn't he couldn't go on. Uh, she kind of had like the cushiest job ever, if you think about it, because her job was just being an absolute. <laughs> people <laughs> more like the, the weakest stink am i right <laughs> <laughs> yeah but yeah i had this board game before i remember it wasn't very good but what do you expect from a weakest link board game it's just kind of like you answer trivia questions and there were, you would oh, play no, some right. audio like files maybe of Anne robinson saying uh you are the weakest link goodbye you know it's not like it wasn't her it was jane lynch you know that actress nope Oh wait, is she you'll from recognize her Glee? when you see her face. Yeah, from Glee. There yeah, the sports coach mm-hmm. lady. Uh, it's it was her who did it. I've not watched Glee anyway. Uh, good license games. Yeah, I played Villainous, which I do like quite a bit. It's a really great beginner's asymmetric game if you want to like, you know, start experiencing that kind of style of game. Then you can kind of move on from there. Um, uh, I really want to play one of those The Thing games, one of the two ones that kind of you know, have come out or are coming out so Infection Outbreak at, at Outpost Infection at Outpost 31 That's the one. There's that one <laughs> eh, something like that uh, and there's the one that we talked about earlier this year that came out on Kickstarter, I think it's called The Thing Yeah, I think it's just called The Thing like that. Yeah because uh, I'm a big fan of the film, so I would like to play some of those. But we have seen a big resurgence of genuinely good licensed games, because I think naturally, as board games become more popular and the, you know, the age group playing them has gotten older, um, you know, publishers have kind of like caught on to, oh, we can cater to that, and it doesn't have to be, you know, rubbish. There you go. Yeah. Oh, I was actually looking at our own list. Um of the best movie board games dune yeah. dune, dune is a really really yeah. good game people love dune i want to play that so yeah Mm-mm-mm. all right uh me and would you like to read this one from peter please yes i can do that great <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi guys a team johnny has mentioned in the past they like to take games with him when he goes to the pub is that a johnny thing or a common <laughs> practice what are some of your favourite travel-sized games for either pub outings or just to have in case of a gaming opportunity? Uh, keep up the good work and stay safe. 
Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, we will try. <laughs> yeah, it's a. I think I'm confident in saying it's a pretty common thing. Like, yeah, I yeah. do it. Yeah, it's not, not just, just a Johnny, Johnny thing. thing. Don't worry. Um, yeah. Actually, Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking like, Lodi's mentioned love letter earlier. Love letter is just a perfect small. It's you know fourteen cards. There's like nothing of it. 16, 16. 16 also, cards. I was gonna say love letter has some of the best licensed versions of itself. Yeah, true. Yeah. Like Batman. Bat- ba- Batman's well, good one. Batman's it doesn't make sense, great. but no, I th- I think the Hobbit one, Archer ones are great. I haven't Hobbit done one? the advent. Yeah. yeah, it's really good. Wait, what? Which the Hobbit are we talking about? Martin Freeman Hobbit. This is called the Hobbit. Oh, oh well, at least he's got Lee Pace. In Movie it. Hobbit. I can I can have something good to look at while I'm being born. <laughs> anyway, yeah, got some good versions. <laughs> There's a peek behind the curtain there. <laughs> Uh, what was the question? Oh yeah, travel game. Yeah, sorry, Matt, I interrupted you. Go ahead. Oh no, I was, I was just saying love letter. Yeah, love letter is perfect. Uh, the two that I stick by are skull. Skull's always amazing. Oh. Uh, skull, you don't need to take to the pub because you can just play it with beer mats if you want. Uh, mm-hmm. And hive pocket is the other one that I absolutely adore. Those are. Oh boy. What? Sorry. <laughs> You're not a fan of that hives. Was, that was such a negative reaction to your choices. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'll just... It just came out. No, that's all right. I'll just change my opinion about the games I enjoy. Wow. Uh, I, but to be fair, Hive Hive is quite like a thinky game for the pub, maybe. It's not quite To be as... fair. No, no, I agree. They're both good games. No, apparently not. No, 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 they, are, they are both good games. I guess I just wouldn't have chosen them myself. I think Skull is like a good pub game right get a load of people around yeah, the table skull is great it's pretty like they're both pretty resilient having water spilled on them why are you looking at that lowly skull is legitimately <laughs> Fine. great hey lowly's what would you take to the pub <laughs> love oh no 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 i don't like that no. <laughs> <laughs> love letter yes oh. uh, uh, uh there's a game also i'm not allowed to talk about um oh, uh, okay i uh, oh Twin It. Have you ever played Twin It? That's a great game. Very rowdy, though. It's by the same uh, designer as Jungle Speed. Um, but it's just, like, a bunch of cards, and it's great. It's like, it's like, it's like Snap, but, like, turned up, like, 3,000. Oh, wow. Yeah, Snap 3,000? I think you mentioned Twin It on this podcast before. I've not I played think, it. Yeah. We should play it when we yeah, can. Yeah, it just comes in a tin. And, like, the thing is, even, like, the tin is too big. It's, it's literally, like, too decks of cards but they're like really small square so you could like definitely just put them anywhere and take them with you um mm. really good game highly recommend and it's very pretty as well um the only thing is you need quite a lot of table space mm. so it's not like it's not like if you are in a pub and have like a tiny table that's not ideal mm. yeah. also also you kind of need to move drinks the maybe set- this is not yeah, a good pub that- game <laughs> <laughs> you're just clearing off no 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 sorry we need your table uh, no, I mean, like, I, they were asking for travel ga- to size games, technically. So. Yeah. Come on. Um, doesn't yeah. have to be a pub. Can't... But yes, that's that's one of my faves. And it's, like, super easy to explain. It's really mad, rowdy, fun. It gets everyone's energies up. And then Love Letter is, like, the opposite. It's, like, subdued and more, like, thinking and mm, less yeah. space. Yeah. There are two lowlies inside everyone. <laughs> A rowdy one and one a one that's all thinking and subdued. Yeah, exactly. Those are the two sides of me and those are the two games that go with that. Mm. <laughs> okay, for me it would be Q. I love oh. a bit of Q. Oh. Me, what's wrong with Q? <laughs> I cannot believe this insolence that is happening right now. <laughs> <laughs> love Ricky, but not a fan of Koo. <laughs> you like... I just can't believe this. How can you like Love Letter and not like Koo? They're basically the same game. <laughs> it's it's fine. But it's not great. <laughs> okay, well, Koo's one of them. Um, another, one, another one is called Penguin Party, uh, which I love so much. I've talked to Matt about this game before. Uh, it's so good. It's by... Um, Rainer Knizia, uh, and it's a, a game where you sort of have to build like a pyramid of cards collectively, and um, 
uh, only cards can only be placed in certain places, and because it's a pyramid, each line of cards uh, is gets you know shorter and shorter, uh, and so it means that inevitably not everyone's cards are going to be able to fit in the pyramid. And the theme of the game is so good uh, because uh, you have the different penguins that are going <laughs> to the party. Um, there's a very specific version of the game with art that I love that my friends have. I think you can get it from... I I suspect it might be a Japanese exclusive. <laughs> but it's got, like, uh, different types of penguins. So that there's an emperor penguin. Uh, and there's, like... What are the little penguins that have the little feathers? Like, the gold feathers sticking out? Um, I can't remember what Sorry, they are. Not but, a penguin expert. Yeah, well, there's different penguins, and we've given them different <laughs> names. Uh, and they all have different drinks as well. Uh, and there's one penguin called Chad the Lad that I like very much. Uh, and he has a pint, and he's great. Chad the Lad. There you go. All right. I um, think... Speaking of different... Sorry, just real quick. Speaking of different versions of games, and you did bring up Coup. Did you know that there's a Brazilian version of Coup, and it is stunning? It is, oh, like, wow. way prettier than normal Coup. Maybe I'll have a look. Please mm. do, because it is stunning. <laughs> <laughs> I found out about it a few years ago, and I've been obsessed with it ever since. What? There are f- a few games like that, I feel, where the artwork for other territories or from other publishers is just... Mm. like I think Oint Games did a version of Modern Art, and the version of Modern Art from Oint Games is really, really lovely. Mm. And it's got a completely different... I mean, normal Modern Art is a bit... Some people love it, some people hate it. Um, like Another I think they... game, right? Yeah. Um, but I think the oink one comes with like tiny little easels you can put your paintings on. Oh. And stuff like that. Oh, I love oink games. They're so good. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. good. And actually, oink games are a really good suggestion for travel games in general because all yeah. of their games are tiny. Yeah. Tiny, tiny. Fake oh. artist. Fake I would artist probably say your... is the best one. What's the one that I Deep Sea played? Adventure is the most yeah, popular one. Deep Sea one. Adventure is mm. really good. There's another one I played where you have to build your own towns. Um, your own towns. Out of different, you have these different cards, these little cards, and you have to... Everyone has the same amount of cards, and you have to, in a time limit, try and build a town with a certain amount of, like, key sort of pick things in them, so, like, people or roads or things like that. Uh, and then the person who scores the most each round is like the winner. All right, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's an Oink Games game. Uh, Oink Games are Japanese as well, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you go. What links we have? Mm-hmm. Have you seen Have you seen the Brazilian version of Coup? I mean, I need to see. I need to hear your reaction. <laughs> look, okay. Someone read this question out while I look. <laughs> while I look at this. Uh, all right, I'll read this one from Adam. Hi Desperic team, recently I took the decision to delete my Twitter account which I was using to follow and engage with tabletop wargaming hobbyists. I found that the community have become increasingly toxic over the last 12 months, with petty arguments and infighting overtaking more positive aspects of the hobby. For the benefit of my own mental health, I decided to remove myself from the online community and to limit my engagement to offline groups. My question, in your personal lives do you tend to prefer online or offline hobby engagement? Have you had similar negative experiences with board game or tabletop RPG online communities? If so, why do you think this is? Thanks again, and please keep up the good work, Adam. Thanks, Adam. That's a great question, Adam. Yeah. First of all, over to me, and have you seen it yet? <laughs> I feel like we're ruining the mood here with this, but um, yeah, I've seen it, Lolies. I've, I've looked at the Kickstarter. It looks incredible, yeah. I love the art okay. style. It's, it's awesome. Very um, impressionist, I think. Anyway, yes, there it's you go. Nice. Right. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes, Adam. Sorry, we're back to you now. Yes. Back to the studio. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's move on. Yes, no, I'm so good. Um, yeah, it, it's it is I prefer I mean I personally prefer IRL like interaction with the community, but I've definitely come across like kind of toxic behavior, both IRL. I think most more IRL than online. I think IRL, I think online I've, I've managed to avoid it a bit more because if I see something I don't like, I just don't look. Whereas in real life, it's a bit, it can be a bit harder to get away from it, especially if you're like sat around a table playing a game. I 
don't want to be like strappy and get up in the middle of a game but like sometimes uh yeah i've just had some bad bad times like a lot of mansplaining um especially if you're a woman in the hobby i think at, at like games conventions um even i was around at uh this this girl um had had invited me around to her house to play games i didn't re- i just knew her from online and um I'd been around her house, I think, a couple of times before, and it was always great. But this one time, there was this guy there, and he was just, like, talking down to me. And it was really uncomfortable, and I just did not... Like, he was explaining a game to me I, I knew. He was playing explaining The Crew to me, which I had played a few times. and um, But, like, I, I made a mistake in a round, and he, like, really lay into me about it. And I was just like, mate, I just it was a mistake. Like, uh, like And also, The Crew is the kind of game... You, you don't communicate, so, like, I didn't know it was a mistake until I kind of did it because I had to play a card but I didn't know the other information around the table which is the whole game um, and it just made me feel really uncomfortable that I haven't really wanted to go back there um, but I yeah, also haven't terrible. been invited back <laughs> <laughs> but also that was just before the pandemic hit so I won't take it personally <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, but yeah that's I, I feel like IRL it's been harder to avoid um, whereas online I just Either I get involved and get into a fight, or, or I just uh, I just ignore them and and try and look for more positive communities. Mm. Um, Indeed, yeah. Mr. Java. Well, I feel obviously like my perspective is obviously that of a very privileged cishet white man. So I feel like you know anything I say here should be taken with a huge grain of salt because I don't you know I'm just not the the target of some of this stuff, which is horrendous in its own way um i definitely like i definitely prefer offline interactions but i think i largely play games with groups of friends that i know um because when i've attended conventions it's to work um mm. so it's being run for a demo i don't i rare very rarely sit down at tables to just play with people for a couple of hours it is with kind of the purpose of i'm looking at this game to cover it or to review it or whatever it might be um, so it's like I will go for a demo with the designer and it's quite a professional kind of thing and that nearly all of the board game conventions I've attended has been under that kind of or been in that um, guise mm-hmm. um, and I think uh, you know o- online communities definitely you know they the, the internet in general let's say can be a, a horrendous place at, at points um, like I've certainly had to back away from parts of it for my own mental health um like i took an extended kind of step back from twitter um earlier this year because i just couldn't couldn't really stick it um Mm. you know and some sometimes it's the big things and sometimes it's the small things um but it was just i massively noticed a shift when i stepped away from it i was like Mm. oh wow um so yeah i mean again like i i realized i'm speaking from a position that is very um privilege and so like i i simply can't speak to some of the you know some of the behavior that goes on which i know goes on um but you know i've i've just not been in the the situation where i've experienced a lot of it either because i've been attending these things as like someone covering it as a journalist or because of you know my particular background and so on um so yeah it is it's horrendous i think it's one of those things where you know just look out for yourself look out for other people you know when you see it call it out Mm. you know if if the whether it's conventional whether it's online like those measures should should be in place to protect people um but you know at the end of the day if you need to step back from it to look after yourself that's what you should do you know Mm. no no hobby is worth putting yourself or others at any kind of like risk or um you know uh like heart like affecting your health negatively Um. Mm. yeah i can't really speak for like the wargaming community because i've not really played war games and interacted with the people who do but i can say i've had some unpleasant experiences with certain types of people who like to use the hobby as like a a a way of thinking that they're better than other people because they think they understand it more or they think they're better at it and I do remember when I left uni and started uh, playing board games at like a local cafe that I lived near as like a, well, I want to 
meet some new friends in this area. There were some really lovely people I met there and really welcoming, lovely. But there were some people who, who like look down on people because they maybe don't get it straight away or they're not, mm. they don't think in the same way that they do. Um, or they play the game incredibly competitively uh, and to the point where, you know, it can be upsetting to play against those kind of people and I hate that sort of thing. And it really makes me quite cross because, like, I love board games and tabletop RPGs and I love this hobby and I love the idea of introducing new people to this hobby. Uh, That's one of the reasons why I want to do this job. Uh, that's what we do here at Dicebreaker, especially introduce people who may not be the traditional type of person to play board games and tabletop RPGs, who might feel very uncomfortable having introduction, you know, interactions with those kinds of people. So the way they act makes me quite angry. And I think nowadays I would have a lot more courage to stand up and confront those kind of people and say, you know what, you're the problem with this community. You're the reason why some people claim it's dying or whatever. No, it's not going anywhere. You're just like you're just putting up a wall against other people joining in and you know feeling more comfortable in this space. And it was like when um oh my gosh um when the wheelchair uh supplement for D D was released this year last year this year yeah. this year i think um by why can't i remember their name matt jarvis sarah thompson that's the one sarah put it out a uh, creator made this amazing supplement to allow players to create a character who could um you know move around in a wheelchair and you know have their own abilities and and you know, be a a person in the game, and there was it was wonderful, but there was some really awful reactions to it, and it just makes me so cross with with like those people, and I'm like, what is what's the problem here? Like, do you have to police like other people who want to also have fun and see themselves represented in something that they enjoy, like? I yeah I just don't understand people who make it their mission to decide what is allowed and what's not, and so those people can get in a toilet and flush themselves away as far as I'm concerned, because they deserve to be in the sewers with all the crocodiles and I don't know, the the chuds that may be living down there, um, yeah or a giant snake, um but yeah no uh, it is good to to champion positivity though like there are a lot of rubbish people in the community that's the unfortunately that is the way of it but there are also some really wonderful people uh and i think if you're struggling maybe seek those wonderful people out more than the the rubbish ones even if it means like muting certain topics or like unfollowing certain people or just yeah stepping away for a while as for in public if those people do give you a hard time you know there there are lovely people who you're probably playing with at exactly the same time who maybe you can talk to quietly or if you're not comfortable with confronting those people yourself um yeah the the moral of the story is as much as there's some rubbish people there's also some lovely people so those level people will will help you there you go P- yeah. put them in the toilet the rubbish ones <laughs> oh help <laughs> I'll, I'll flush <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah thank you for your questions everybody mm. uh again if you've got a question for us you can find us at podcast at dicebreaker.com but that's almost all we have time for this week <gasps> but before we leave you let's look ahead to the next week or so lowly's representative of the video team this week what's coming up on youtube.com <laughs> for slash dicebreaker <laughs> I'm ready. Don't don't even be looking at me. I'm ready. Um, <laughs> well, Matt Jarvis, I'm glad you asked. This week we will, uh, well, we will have done at this point a lovely um, chill painting stream. Some of us, some of us, yeah. I don't, I don't know who, but some of us will have done a surprise. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dungeon Breaker, of course, returns tomorrow, and it will be the last episode of Would You Believe. 
Is that the name? Would you believe it? Would you believe it? Would you believe it? Okay. Would you believe they put a goblin on the sword coast? (laughs) Oh, Oh, that really tickled me. (laughs) And on Sunday, you'll get that list that uh, Wheels is currently working on of the best family games. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. Get that potato peeler out. Yeah, peel your eyes. Please do. (laughs) Please the Dicebreaker don't. podcast would like to say for health and safety purposes, please do not peel your own eyeballs with a potato peel. <laughs> yeah, please don't do that. Please don't do that, yeah. Um, so that's what's up this week. All right. Over to you. Wonderful. Editorial team. Uh, <laughs> uh, and quickly, uh, Lolis, what came out on Sunday? This Sunday? Uh, it was Johnny. Johnny did a thing. He did a, he did a Blood Bowl review. <laughs> oh. That was last Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was last Sunday. Go check that out, you people. Yeah, you like <laughs> miniatures games and whatever, wargaming. Yeah, he yes. seemed to really enjoy he, it. Yeah. He loves it. So mm. g- go watch him talk about it. And he's got a new haircut. So for at the yeah. very least, just go check out his haircut. Yeah, yeah. he's <laughs> looking very sharp. Go for the uh, haircut, yeah. stay for the blood bowl. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's how we should have titled the video. Johnny's new haircut, also a blood bowl review. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, that would probably do quite well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, on DiceBreaker.com, we don't have any haircut news, uh, so to speak of, but we do have plenty <laughs> of news. Uh, thanks to our lovely news writer Chase and of course Alex Meehan uh, and myself yeah also I'm here. also here <laughs> yeah. um, but coming up in the next week or so uh, Alex Meehan you've been looking ahead to 2021 and the games coming out that's the, for, for see... podcast listeners Alex Meehan is putting her hand to her head and look, looking into the distance for, for board games I can see some <laughs> board games there ahoy, ahoy ahoy board games on the horizon the please hoping. anything on the horizon other than this year <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, I wrote a list of the, the top 10 upcoming board games you should pay attention to that are coming out hopefully next year. Uh, I cannot 100% confirm that. That's just what they've said, so please don't have a go at me if it doesn't happen, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's a really great list of all sorts. Um, so if you want to know what's worth uh, saving your pennies up for... That's the one. Uh, have a look at that list. Yeah. All right. Uh, we also have, if you're into Magic the Gathering, we have a, a kind of list of recommendations for Christmas gifts. Uh, <gasps> if you or someone in your life is into Magic, I suppose I should say, because you don't, unless you want to get a gift for yourself, that's also, you know, yeah, you treat you. Gift yeah, for yourself. It's, you treat it's yourself. A, a, yeah, it's been a tough year. You you get yourself something. Yeah, some um, nice Magic cards. Yeah. Buy yourself something nice. But Jason Coles, who's a, a very kind of experienced Magic writer, has put that together for us. So mm. yeah, go check it out. There's some good recommendations yeah. on there. Uh, there is a there is a general there's a board game Christmas guide. There uh, is gift list as well that you can have a look at for the board game lovers in your life. That also includes you. <laughs> mm-hmm. And also on next week's podcast, which will be back here uh, on Friday. We will have a special guest joining us, <gasps> uh, which I'm very what? excited about. This is the first time I've heard of this. This is so, live. <laughs> yeah. So uh, you'll have to tune in next Friday to see who joins us. But I'm very excited. They're very, very lovely. Um, so, yes, look forward to that. That will be December the something. Oh, December the gosh. something. December the 4th. That was when that podcast will come out. I have to remember that we don't record it on the day it goes out. Uh, time. <laughs> what? What is time? Yeah. Uh, in the year 2020 but until next week uh, this has been the Dicebreaker podcast thank you for listening thank you to Alex Lolis thank you for having me it's been such a joyful time <laughs> to do thanks Alex and me and <laughs> yeah yeah it's been great <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been Matt Jarvis I've also been here uh, thank you for joining us stay safe out there look after yourselves and we will be back next Friday but until then have a lovely day Bye. Bye.